Our Father, we are so grateful for the love you have for us, which is so deep, so broad, so amazing. It's like a shoreless sea. Thank you. And Lord, as we gather here this evening, um, we are going to study uh, another very important topic. And once again, as we come before you, we thank you for the precious blood of Jesus that washes away our sin and for his righteousness that covers us. We request these things. We pray, Lord, for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit that you will be our teacher and that it will be your voice that we hear tonight. I pray you will once again speak through uh, this humble instrument that you will give to him your, your strength, your wisdom, your words, your thoughts, I pray. Lord, you know the needs of each one here tonight, and I pray you'll give something specific and special for them. I don't know the needs of, of the folks here tonight, but you, sh you sure do know those needs. And so I pray you will provide those needs to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. We thank you for this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, um, <clears throat> I used to teach at a Christian college, and the presentation that uh, I'm going to give tonight, if I only had one sermon to preach to a group of Christians, it would be the one we're going to look at tonight. If that was my last sermon, um, this, would be the, this would be the one to a group of Christians. If it was non-Christians, then my sermon would be different. But um, I'd like to do a, just a quick, quick review. We are learning... The sanctuary is teaching us um, how to have a relationship with Christ. In the outer court, we're learning, the sanctuary teaches us how to become Christians. That first we come to Christ, we accept Him as our sacrifice for our sin, we then commit our lives to Jesus, and baptism is the ceremony that, that the Lord gave to us for that process. And out here we learn how to become Christians, but in the holy place, we're learning how to remain a Christian. And uh, in our last presentation, we studied about the menorah, which was symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And we, we studied what the Bible has to say about the Holy Spirit. But one of the, the main job of the Holy Spirit is to apply to us, to our lives, what Jesus accomplished at the cross for us. And it's the work of the Holy Spirit to, to transform the life. I'll let that sink in. Um, a person will be different who is a Christian than a person who is not a Christian. There's going to be a difference. And you're going to be different from when you first gave your life to Jesus to when you start following him. God transforms our lives to make us like Jesus, to live under the principle of love and not selfishness. <clears throat> um, the table of showbread is going to be our focus today. And the table of showbread was on the north side of the tabernacle. The table itself was made of acacia wood. Again, the acacia wood uh, used before its enduring nature and its strength. And it was overlaid with gold to make it portable and lighter. It was about three feet long, a foot and a half wide, and two feet, two and a half feet high. And uh, what was special about it were the loaves that sat on top of it. There were two stacks, six on each side, 12 total, and they represented uh, each tribe of the 12 tribes of Israel. And the bread was known as the show bread or the bread of presence. And the bread was made fresh every Sabbath. Now, how many here make fresh bread? Now, you know fresh bread doesn't keep very well. Yet this bread did. And it was a miracle that God pr provided every year. I mean, excuse me, every week to keep that bread fresh. And at the end of the week then, it was used by the priests and their family. It was allowed to be eaten. And, uh, and the table, of course, stood on the north Side. And so this bread is extremely significant uh, in our walk with Christ, and we're going to learn what it means. So everybody should have their lessons with them. Let's take a look at question number one. How does the bread point us to Jesus? John 6.48 says, Jesus said, I am the what? Bread. The 
bread of life. Are you noticing that everything in the sanctuary points to Jesus? All of it does. He is the bread of life. And so, this is a reminder, just as it was to ancient Israel, it is to us today, that God is the one that provides all our needs. Not just physical, but spiritual. But let's focus more on the spiritual at, at this juncture. Number two, what is it that Jesus wants us to feed upon to maintain our spiritual health? Matthew 4.4 4 says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You know, how long, how long would we last if we ate food, <coughs> if we stopped eating food? We wouldn't last very long, would we? I think I last longer now than I used to. <laughs> but, uh, but the fact is we wouldn't last very long. And so just as eating physical food, if we stop eating physical food, we won't last long. We will die. If we don't eat spiritually, we will die. The only difference is when you die spiritually, you don't fall over. Right? But you can still be dead spiritually, not connected with the Lord. Uh, Jeremiah, if, well, you know, before we go on, let's really drink in what Jesus is saying. And I, I pray, Lord, help us to see this. Jesus answered and said, it is written, talking about God's word, man shall not live. By bread alone. It's not just physical food, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We need God's word. We're going to flesh that out a little more. And what we're running into right here, right now, is the second component in the sanctification process. The walk with Jesus. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, your words were found, and what did he do? He ate them, and you know, there's the old adage, you are what you... You eat. And so at, just as we eat physical food and it becomes part of us, we're learning. Uh, what uh, Barbara O'Neill is saying is the food we eat uh, contributes to our DNA. And it's the same thing with spiritual food. Whatever, what we, what we, when we feed on the Word of God, it has a correlating impact upon the life. So important for us to realize this. Okay, number three. Since the bread points to Jesus and his word, what impact will it have on my life if I prayerfully study it? 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being what? Transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And what Paul introduces to us here is something that I refer to as natural law. Okay, this is a natural law. What is it? All right, that's gravity. Okay, I don't believe in gravity. <laughs> Didn't matter, did it? Whether I believe it or not, gravity works. Isn't that right? And that's a law that God has created. Well, God has created many laws, and one of the laws he has created is one that he implanted in the mind that by beholding, we become changed. You know, as kids, we used to say, monkey see, monkey do. Uh, in, in, the, in the old days, and computer programmers used to say, junk in, junk out. You know, the, the, the imitation, we're, we're created to emulate, to imitate. God has created us to do that. And so, as we spend time with God's Word, and as Paul is bringing out here, and we're beholding the character of God, we're transformed. Now we can all go home. That's just how it works. I, I'm not going to become like Jesus by wishing. I'm not going to be transformed by wishing or just wanting. But I am transformed by spending time with God. You know, when I grew up uh, in Southern California, I used to be really into sports. And I used to watch the Los Angeles Lakers. And you know, each of the players had their own unique style of play. And you could just go to any park and watch a basketball game and you already knew who the heroes were of the various players by the stuff they were doing. If you saw a sky hook, Kareem. If you saw a turnaround jump shot, that was James Worthing. If you saw a no-look pass, that was Magic Johnson. We imitate our heroes. We imitate whatever we're focused upon. That's the way we're wired. How many times have we not heard of a mass shooting in a school and then when we study the lives of the kids who have done it, we start learning who their heroes were. 
what they were watching, what they were listening to. Without realizing it, they were programming themselves to kill. You know, it's really interesting, by the way. Um, some of you are too young to remember Columbine. That was the first mass shooting we had. And in the, in the Columbine shootings, um, you know, the world, the, 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 the country, and I'm, I would imagine the world, was just horrified by what had happened. And there was a congressional study, study that was done to try to get to the bottom of what had happened. And, uh, and I was kind of following this because I, you know, I, I was studying to be a teacher, you know. And uh, this very much concerned me. Um, but something came out in that congressional study that really surprised me. I'll never forget it. It was in that study that I learned, you know, a lot of the, the, the computer games for killing was actually a, a designed for the military to des desensitize their troops to be able to kill and it not bother them. It was to desensitize them. That, that was the whole history behind the development of the, of the shooting computer games. Of course, now they're being marketed for our kids. And it was interesting because in that congressional study, one of the congressmen stood up and said, we are training our children to kill and to enjoy doing it, is what, is what they said. It was powerful. But the thing is that we're created to imitate. And so as we spend time, Paul is saying, it is written, man should not, no, excuse me, uh, but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror, and if you do, do a little research there, James uh, in the book of James, he refers to a mirror as God's law. And we're going to talk about that, and God's law is a reflection of his character. Behold, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, which is his character, are being what? Transformed in the same image from glory to glory, just as by what? The Spirit of the Lord. And so as we study the Bible, as we study God's law in the Bible, to learn about God, the whole time we're doing it, what's the Holy Spirit doing? He is imperceptibly changing us, our thoughts the way we view things. He is transforming our lives. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> is it possible that my transformation is proportionate to the time I spend with God and His Word? Mm -hmm. Simple math. Mm -hmm. It's just simple math. Second Peter 1.4 By which, he says, have been given to us exceedingly great and precious what? promises that through these you may be partakers of what? That's amazing. The divine nature, whoa, what's that? When you ask God into your life, the Holy Spirit comes, and He is divine. So now I have two natures. I have the fallen nature that I was born with, but now I have the divine nature. And that's why I have to be born again, because I need the divine nature to have power to suppress the fallen nature. Does that make sense? And so which of the two sides is going to be stronger? The one I feed. <clears throat> that's the one that's going to have a stronger influence in my life the one I feed Does that make, we're talking simple math we have choices to make don't we friends if we want God's transforming power in our life then we are going to have to make some new decisions we have to remember that the Bible is not an ordinary book it is not it is the power of God and as I meditate upon that as I think about it as I pray before I read it, I am allowing God's power to be unleashed in my life. Remember, you are what you eat. It's just that simple. Number four, how much of the scriptures are we commanded to study and believe? Luke 24, 25 says, believe what? All the prophets have spoken. Okay, all that the prophets have spoken. And where do we find all that the prophets have spoken? In the Old Testament specifically. Isn't that true? And so here's Luke. By the way, is Luke a New Testament or an Old Testament writer? So here's a New Testament writer who is telling you, believe what the prophets have said. You know, we find people today that say, oh, no, 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 no. I'm a New Testament Christian. We don't do the Old Testament. But here's a New Testament writer who's telling you to believe everything the Old <laughs> the, the prophets have spoken. Does that make sense? Okay, uh, here's another one. Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. By the way, who, who wrote this book? Anybody know? Timothy. Well, it was written to Timothy. Who wrote it? Paul. 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 Is he a New Testament character? Absolutely. 
So, what does he say? What's the first word? All. Okay, by the way, how much of all is all? All. <laughs> it's all. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be what? Complete. Complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. If he is not reading all of Scripture then, according to what Paul says here, can he be complete? No. Paul says you need it, how much? All. all. Not half. Not some, but all. But now I'm going to tighten this a little more. When Paul wrote this, was there even a New Testament? No. It wasn't, it wasn't even developed. It was in the process of being written. So what specifically is he referring to here? The Old Testament. The Old Testament is still relevant. Now we know the New Testament is too. We know that. The only point I'm trying to make is, some are saying that the Old Testament is done away with, and Paul and Luke are saying no. So I'm going to go with the apostles. How about you? That's what I'm going to do. Remember what I said, don't trust your soul to man. Trust it to God's word. And this is the thing that I really want to impress upon all of us here tonight. When this book becomes our reality, we're going to view things differently. Do you realize that men and women were willing to be burned alive so you can have this book? There's something about this book. This is not a typical, ordinary book. It is, it's different. And, uh, you know, but the sad reality is there is a crisis today in the Christian world of biblical ignorance. Not only biblical ignorance, but even confidence in the Word of God. Uh, in a book entitled uh, Reforming Fundamentalism uh, by George A. Marsden, he quotes a survey a student believed in one of the largest Evangel uh, evangelical seminaries in the United States, and in the poll, it indicated that 85% of, of, of the students do not believe the inerrancy of Scripture. And these are the future pastors. 85% do not believe that the Word of God is inerrant. Um, I'm going to skip this one and go to this one. Um... Barna Research Group. Are you familiar here familiar with Barna? Barna uh, does uh, a lot of the research studies of things that are taking place in the uh, in the Christian world. And in fact, if you run into any research at all about what's happening in the Christian world, there is probably a ninety percent chance it's done by Barna. But Barna Research Group reported in two thousand seventeen that a record few Americans believe the Bible is the literal Word of God. Twenty four percent. This is, this is so serious because the only thing that God has given to us to protect us from the prince of darkness is the Bible. You know, back in the day, the, in the dark ages, the devil was very successful in hiding and trapping the Bible into an ancient language that nobody knew. And so the masses, for centuries, didn't have the Bible. And so they were really encased in ignorance and superstition. The Reformation... Men like Wycliffe and Luther and Huss and Zwigli, God used to put the Bible back into the language of the people. And many of those for doing that were burned alive by the church. But it freed the masses. And they finally came to realize that you're not saved by works, but by faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. Amen. They fell in love with Jesus and they paid the price. A lot of folks died. You know, I'll be honest with you. That is why it is difficult for me to see a Bible sitting on the floor. I, I have a very hard time with that. That is God's Word. That is sacred. And it has to have... You know, in my house, my mother... I grew up in a home where we were Catholic. And in the Catholic Church, they taught us that we're too ignorant to know what the Bible says. So let the priest tell us what the Bible said. And so we didn't study it for ourselves. We just went to church and whatever the priest told us, that was truth. Um, <clears throat> and yet, my mother knew that that book was God's holy book. And so it always held a very prominent place in our home. We had a little coffee table that sat there on the coffee table. And, and, and she always reminded us that it was very sacred. I still remember, I was probably about 
five years old, and my mother was vacuuming the house, and she was in a big hurry, so we'd probably have guests coming, you know, one of those emergency cleanup deals. And so she was vacuuming, and she hit the coffee table accidentally, and the Bible slipped to the ground. And I had a clear shot of my mom and this whole incident, and my mom stood there in horror. And I remember her shutting off the vacuum, going to her knees, picking up the Bible, kissing it, and laying it back mm -hmm. on the desk, on the table. And let me tell you, that made an indelible impression in my mind. I knew that book was different than any other. My mom always treated it with respect. And as Christians, we need to treat our Bible with respect. And it's going to send a message to other people when they see it. It's not an ordinary book. It's the Word of God. And, uh, and we need to, to very much respect that. But what's happening is we're living in a day and age when people are losing confidence in this book. You know, it's interesting that even in, uh, in the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, Christian theologians and pastors were saying, you know, the Bible's been translated so much, we really don't know if the Bible we have today is what the original Bible was. They, they, they you know, and, and so it was started, and as this was written in books, it was causing people to lose confidence in the Bible. Um, but God protects his word. And in the 1940s, a discovery was made, and you know, it was the Dead Sea Scrolls. That, the Dead Sea Scrolls is an extremely significant discovery. Uh, the oldest manuscripts that we have at that time of the Bible uh, dated back to about 900 um, A.D. That was, about the, that was the oldest manuscripts we had. But the Dead Sea Scrolls were, uh, are dated at 126 B.C., a thousand years older. So these, these uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls predated Christ. So it would have been the scriptures that Jesus had. So the scholastic world wanted to know how accurate our scriptures were, and they compared them. And you know what they found? A few misspellings. God has protected his word, friends. The Bible that you have would have been the Bible Jesus had. Are you with me? You can trust your word. Now, you know, we can get into the discussion how there are some translations that are more accurate than others. Yes, there is truth to that. If you have the King James, the New King James, or the American Standard, those are the clearest. I'll just tell you right now. I have The manuscripts that those three are drawn from are your clearest. But I'm not putting down the others. I'm not putting the others down. But I'm just saying, if you really want to do some heavy-duty studying and unpacking, you're going to have to have those books handy. Does that make sense? But, but my point is that your, your Bible, you can trust the Bible that you have, and we need to because it's the only thing that God has given to us to expose the devil's deceptions and lies for these last days. You know, I really believe Jesus is coming soon. Amen. I, have, I could tell you the stuff that I'm seeing happening in the world today is telling me that we don't have much, much time longer, and I don't know about you, I want him to hurry up and come and bring an end to the misery of this planet. Just get us out of here. But God wants the world to know so that they have a chance too, to know Jesus as a friend. Whom did Jesus say the scriptures and the prophecies reveal? Luke 24, 27 says, At beginning at Moses and the prophets, he expounded to them in all things the things that concerning who? Himself. Himself. And so Jesus is here talking to his, to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. You know the story. Hit this one. Oh, did I? Yeah. Oh, I skipped one. It jumped ahead. Let's see if I can back this thing up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And, um, but the Bible is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. All of it. And by beholding him, we become changed. Jesus said, and this is eternal life, that they might know thee, that they the one true God and Jesus Christ who thou hast sent. That is eternal life, is knowing Jesus, is spending time with him. It's not club membership that's going to save us, friends. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. John 5.39 says, Search the scriptures, for they are they which testify of who? Me. Of me. Uh, Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, the revelation of who? Jesus. He is the only hope for humanity, is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the primary focus 
of the Bible and of the sanctuary. Let's take a look at number six. What is another name used in the Bible for Jesus? John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the what? Word. The Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was what? Word. Was God. John 1.14 says, and the Word was made what? Word. Flesh and dwelt among us. And what is this book called? The Word. The Word. It's all about Jesus. Who is the Word? Can I just blow your mind for a minute? Just stay with me. What did God do to bring everything into existence? God's Word has created power. This is the reason why God can't lie. If, God, if Jesus were here and he said there's an elephant in the corner, there'd be an elephant in the corner because his word is created power. Now, we, all of us in this room, in this room itself, has atoms. Isn't that true? What happens if you split one of those? You have an explosion. You split one. How many atoms do we have in here? How many do we have in Hendersonville? How many do we have in the United States? How many do we have in the world, in the universe? Do we have any idea of the power of God? And that power is in here. It is the Word. It is God's creative power. And when we humble ourselves and read and yield our lives to it, that power is unleashed in our, in our life through the power of the Holy Spirit to recreate in us a new person. Is that not amazing? I still remember the day that it dawned on me that the red letters in the Bible were actually the words of Jesus recorded. I remember running my finger over those red letters and I was just amazed that I could touch the words of God. Amazing. But what a privilege we have as a people to have this book. What a privilege. And how important it is for us to be spending time in it so that it will avail us of that power, so that power will come into our lives. So, so important. Okay, let's take a look at number seven. What kind of people did God use to write the Bible? Second Peter 1.21 says, Holy men of God spoke as they were what? Moved by the Holy Spirit. So what happens here is that the Holy, the, the Holy Spirit gave the men the thoughts, maybe visions, but gave them the thoughts, and then they wrote it down in their own words. Why is that important? Because they're communicating to humans the thoughts of God. It's, it's not something a man made up. God impressed them. God moved upon their mind to write it. But the thoughts are God's. The words and the writing is man's. Does that make sense? It's because it's supposed to communicate to us. So very important. What's the next one? Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, who gave, uh, who God, which God gave him to what? Show his servants things which must shortly take place. <clears throat> and so who is the author? Jesus. It's God, isn't it? He just had servants write down his thoughts. Your Bible is God's fully authoritative, inerrant word. Now, you know, when you read it, sometimes some things may appear to be um, contradictory, but if you keep studying, you're going to find they harmonize. There is no contradiction. God is not bipolar. He does not contradict himself. All right? Now, sometimes because of our limited understanding, some things may appear to be contradictory to us, but as we continue to prayerfully study, they will harmonize and we'll go, okay, got it. I see it now. Does that make sense? I mean, you've had that experience, by the way. And then it made sense. Oh, once you study into it. Okay, praise the Lord. So I left you where? Uh, in number seven? Yes. Okay. It is the guide of life. Let's take a look here at number eight. How important should Bible study be to the Christian? Job 23, 12 says, I have treasured the words of his mouth. What's the next word? more than the necessary food. So if Job had a late start to the day and he had to choose between eating breakfast or studying the Word, what choice does that text tell us he made? He studied the Word. That's, that's the choice he made. And then, of course, uh, King David. 
Psalms 119, 105 says, Your what? Word. Your word is a what? Yes. A lamp to my feet and a what? Light. A light into my path. You see, in this old dark world of sin, the only light of truth that we have, the only thing we can fully rely on is God's holy word. You know, I'll, I'll, share, I'll share this with you. If you make the decision to follow this book fully, you're going to feel the presence of God in your life but you are going to be swimming upstream. You're going to swim upstream. You're going to, your eyes are going to be open. You're going to start looking around going, wait a second, why isn't anybody else doing this? <laughs> are, you re are, you re are you with me? We assume a lot of stuff, but when you get into that book, suddenly the Lord, and prayerfully, every time I say we get into the book, I mean prayerfully, so make sure to frame that. But the Lord will begin to reveal things to you that he had revealed to the reformers. He'll reveal things to you he revealed to the apostles. He'll reveal things to you he had been teaching through Christ in his earthly ministry that has been forgotten. That's why the Reformation had to take place. So much is buried, but it's happening again. We need to get back into that book. Let's take a look at number nine. Who helps us understand the Bible? John 14, 26. This was one of the most encouraging texts to me before I read it. When I... <clears throat> when I started reading my Bible, in fact, Suelan, when we were dating, you know those little Gideon Bibles? I still have it, actually. She gave it to me on my birthday, um, and I had a little Mazda 626, an 85 Mazda 626, and there was a little, a little uh, pocket area, and it would fit right in there just perfect. And in the mornings, I started my car, I would have my, my time with the Lord in prayer, and I would read my Bible, and it worked out um, um, really, really awesome. But... I would get discouraged because I would read stuff and I wasn't getting it. Of course, I'm the only one in this room that's had that problem, right? But I would read stuff and I wasn't understanding it. And I would get so frustrated and I would think to myself, you know, because I went to a Christian school, even though I wasn't a Christian at the time, um, I thought to myself, man, I wish I'd pay attention to Bible class. <clears throat> but then I came across this text and it gave me hope. It said, but the helper, who's the helper? The Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you some things. All things. Ah, i got to keep an eye on the pastor. All things, right? And bring to your remembrance, oh, isn't that important as the years pass? <laughs> and bring to your remembrance all the things that I said to you. And, and so this really encouraged me because God was now saying to me, no, 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 I, and your teacher. Have you ever read, been reading the Bible, and suddenly you saw something, it was, it was probably some passage you have read many times before, and you're reading, all of a sudden you have an aha moment, you go, oh wow, I've never seen that. How many of you ever had that experience? Okay, let me tell you what had happened. You had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. That's what happened. The Holy Spirit illuminated your mind. Because spiritual things are spiritually discerned. You can't see the truth unless God reveals it to you. Can't see it. And so <clears throat> that's an aha moment, a revelation. So the Holy Spirit is the one. So Pastor Bhatti, I thought you were our teacher. I am not your teacher. I am a facilitator. I am sharing with you. I am giving witness to what I have learned. But it's the Holy Spirit's job to confirm it in your mind based on what you've been reading and what you've been praying. Does that make sense? He is our teacher. And I am so thankful. And then on top of that, he said he'll bring it to our remembrance. How many times have you ever been witnessing to someone? I mean, first of all, the idea of witnessing scares us half to death. Of course, we can witness about, to a, about a good plumber or a good mechanic. Right? <laughs> but somehow that's different than witnessing. for No, it's not. You just share what you're excited about. That's witnessing. Anyway, how many of you have been in a situation where suddenly you realize there's a witnessing opportunity and you ask God, you shot up a bullet prayer, Lord, don't let me blow this. If there's something you need this poor person to have, give it to them. And all of a sudden, while you're talking, the Bible texts are coming to your mind. Boom, boom. How many of you have had those experiences? And you know what's interesting? The Holy Spirit can't put it out unless we have put it in. He said he'll bring to our remembrance what he has taught us. So as we're studying, he brings it to our mind when it comes time to share. Isn't that true? Mm -hmm. That's so amazing. 
but it is true. Okay, number 10. And, and one other thing before we go to the next one, please remember this. The Holy Spirit will never lead you contrary to the Bible. If, 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 the, if, there, if a thought's coming to your mind to do something contrary to the Scripture, you already know the Spirit. And it's not the Holy One. Holy Spirit will always lead you in harmony with Scripture. Always. Why? He inspired it. And He's not bipolar. He will always operate in harmony. Number 10. What must I do to be certain that the Holy Spirit is guiding my Bible study? Luke eleven nine 9 says, I say to you what? Yes. Ask and it will be given to you. So the first thing is we need to pray and say, Lord, please teach me. Send me the Holy Spirit. Isn't that what Pastor Balti does before we get started? Don't I ask for the Holy Spirit? Sure, because he is the one who teaches us. Luke eleven thirteen. If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who what? Yes. Ask. God is a gentleman. He won't force it on us. We have to ask for it. And, uh, of course, he's a good daddy, and so he's going to give us good gifts. John, and the greatest gift is the Holy Spirit. John 7, 17 says, um, If any man will do his what? Will. will. He will know the doctrine, whether it be of who? God. Of God. And so doctrine means teaching, if the teaching is from God. So, the, uh, you know, very often there is a problem that we typically run into. We all like shortcuts. Don't we like shortcuts? We do like shortcuts. So I have a question about something in my Bible, and instead of studying, I go to my pastor. And I say, is this true? Well, suppose he says yes. Does it mean it is? I mean, do you remember uh, the people in Christ's day, they went to the religious leaders and they said, is this the Messiah? And what did the religious leaders say? No. no. And they rejected their Messiah. Buyer, beware. Don't trust your soul to any man. So what do we do, Pastor? This is what you do. When you have a question, take it to God first. Take it to Him. Then, get your concordance. Of course, now we have computers. It's a lot easier. And research every text and every word those words appear. And try to know that passage as well as you can prayerfully. After you've done all you can know, and if you still haven't figured out, then go ask your pastor. And what will happen is you listen to his answer, you're going to know if he's feeding you a line or if he's giving you truth. And then go study it out to make sure that you got it right. Are you with me? Why? Your soul is dependent on your being careful here. We have an enemy. Paul says that, uh, that the devil even has ministers who disguise themselves as ministers of light. That's what Paul tells us. You've got to make sure that the information, and, and people can err anyway. I mean, I'm growing, everybody's growing. Make sure what you have accepted as truth actually is. Does that make sense? And that's done through studying. Are you with me? You're all awfully quiet out there. All right, what did I do? Ten. Um, did I just finish the last text? I did. Okay, so let's move over to 11. <clears throat> How does the prayerful study of the Word help us? Psalms 119.11 says, Your word I hid in my heart that I might not what? Sin against you. So the word teaches us the truth and gives us strength to, uh, to follow it. It gives us strength to obey God. Does that make sense? So hiding it in our hearts. What's one of the ways we can hide it in our hearts, by the way? Is memorizing it. Yeah. And I sometimes when I'm in a struggle, I will ask God, Lord, is there a text out there that helps me in the situation I'm dealing with. And inevitably, the Lord brings a text to my mind. Uh, I will go look for it and memorize that text. And when the devil comes to discourage me, I will go back to that text to get strength. Does that make sense? Um, the next one, Jeremiah 33, 3. Call to me and I will what? Answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Uh, the Bible, do you realize that there isn't a problem in life that the Bible does not address directly or in principle? Do you realize that every aspect of the human existence is covered in Scripture? God made no mistakes. Whatever your needs are, you're going to find the answer in Scripture. And growing up, you know, we are, we, you know, if you wanted to know what God had to say about marriage, He would tell you who you should be marrying, who you shouldn't be marrying. 
He, he would point that out to you. Um, if you're needing direction for a job, you'll know if a job's asking you to do something that's against his will, you know that's not the job he wants you to have. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Yeah. I remember when Suella and I were first married and she wanted to have kids. I was terrified about having kids. Um, I really was afraid. So I said to her, one condition, we study everything the Bible has to say about having children. I want to know what God has to say. Does that make sense? The Bible has instruction uh, about parenting uh, as well and about our health. And it just, it, there's every aspect of life it tells us. And if we call upon him, he will tell us. So let's take a look at two more texts here. One is Romans 15, 4. For whatever things were written beforehand were written for who? Our learning that through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures we might have what? Oh, isn't that interesting? So what God is saying is when you study here, when you study the life of Israel in the Old Testament, it's relevant to you today. Why? Because the devil that tempted they, them is the same one who's tempting you. Because the problems that they had are the same problems you have today. The devil is not original. Solomon said there is nothing new under the sun. And so when we study what happened to them in the Old Testament, we then have to see how it's impacting us. Open your Bible. I want you to see this text. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 because Paul fleshes out this idea a little more in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. <coughs> If you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, say amen. amen. All right. Let's, uh, Paul is, is, we're coming in the middle of a discussion, and Paul is talking about the history of the children of Israel, okay? And, there, and, and so in verse 11, he says this. Now, all these things happened to, to them as what? Yes. Examples. Now, this next section is going to blow your mind. And they were written. For our admonition. Now how is our, our admonition defined? He defines it. On whom the ends of the age have come. What is that saying? What Paul is saying is that the Bible is more relevant to the people living before the coming of Christ than it was even relevant to the people it was originally written to. Why? Because there's nothing new under the sun. So people that are saying, oh, the Old Testament is done away with, it's only New Testament, are at a terrible disadvantage. Terrible disadvantage. Because it's all relevant to us. I mean, we're going through the sanctuary. We're looking at Christ and how he saves us all. Is this relevant? You better believe it's relevant. Extremely important. James 1, 5. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him what? Beg of God. Ask of God. And it might be given to him. It will be given to them. Isn't that encouraging? God is here for us. He loves us. He wants to help us. And he's saying, ask me. I want to give it to you. I emptied heaven for you. I risked the throne for you. There isn't anything I will withhold, but I won't force it on you. You need to ask, and I'll give it to you. Isn't that cool? I am so thankful. Number 12. What method of Bible study do the scriptures recommend? Isaiah 28.10 says, For precept must be upon precept. Precept must be upon what? Precept. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. line uh, here a little and there a little. And so what, what, what Isaiah here is telling us is that we need to do research. If it's true in Genesis, it's going to be true in Revelation. The Bible is an amazing book written over a period of 1,500 years by many writers from different education, different background, different language, yet they're in perfect harmony. Perfect harmony. That only a miracle can do. The Bible is a miracle. And so God has given that to us to train us, to teach us, and to guide us. And so we need to do uh, um, research. Now, as I mentioned, some things are going to be difficult to understand. Welcome to the club. But if you're studying a topic and, and 30 passages say yes and two passages seem to say no, what do you do? You go with the 30. 
Okay, eventually in time, the other two will line up. It's kind of like when you're putting up a fence. I've had to put up fences, and you know you have the post uh, hammer. I don't know what that thing's called. What's that post called? Digger. Well, it's not the digger. It's, the, it's when you have the post and you got that... Oh, oh, driver. Driver, that's it, a post driver. And I remember doing that, and I had I'd put down like 30 of those posts, and I looked, and I had one post that was out of line. How many of you think I got the other 29 and moved them to catch up to the one? <laughs> Nobody does that, right? You get the one and drop back in. But you know, people that study the Bible do the opposite. They'll say 30 texts that say, yes, you need to do this. And they'll say the two texts that say seem to say no. And they'll go, I'm going that way. Buyer beware. We need to be good detectives. And we need to go with the weight of the evidence. Later on, those other two texts will make sense. Because God's not bipolar, right? They will make sense later, but go with the weight of the evidence. Do research. 1 Corinthians 2.13 But which the Holy Spirit teaches, doing what? Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. 2 Peter 1.20 Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any what? Private. Private interpretation. In other words, it's not about man's opinion. It's about God's communication to you and I. We're not interested in a man's opinion. Men make mistakes. God doesn't. Um, I will say this, when you study your Bible, put aside every preconceived idea. Let the Bible teach you. You know, I, you know, you can study the Bible to prove whatever you want to prove. And you can pull it, you know, there's an old saying, any text out of context is pretext. You can, you can pull it, wrestle a text out and make it, man, I got, a, I got an email this last week. And somebody was reading a book. And the author of the book said something, used a scripture text, and then said, this is what the text was saying. And they, they, they were very alarmed. And they looked at me, and I said, <coughs> I said, sister, get your Bible and open it, and read before and after, and you'll have your answer. That person has done violence to scripture. The Bible wasn't even saying that at all. They just used it to promote their agenda. <laughs> and then she went back and read the scriptures and went, oh, yeah, that was pretty easy. Oh. <laughs> it's like the, when they... Come on after the president gets on there and tells you. The president, I mean, we're not stupid people. We understand what the president's telling us. And then they'll get on there and tell us what they said, what he said, and try and interpret it differently Our system, for, their, for their purpose and propaganda. Our system is broken. Our system is broken. Yeah, I know what you're saying. It is just nauseating. Mm -hmm. It's nauseating. We need Jesus to come. We're actually watching our governmental system and, and, and everything just crumbling in front of our eyes. We are living in a very unique period of the history of our world, especially this nation, this, this beautiful nation. But we are watching our system unravel, Amen. is what we're watching right now. It's amazing. But yes, we need to study for ourselves and think for ourselves. And listen, if you're not thinking for yourself, then somebody else is doing it for you and you're going to be lost. You've got to think for yourself. Study that book for yourself. So important. Okay, where am I? 13? Yeah. What will studying the scriptures do uh, for us? Oh, by the way, again, I wanted to say, <clears throat> when you study, come humbly and just let the Bible teach you. <laughs> let it teach you. Don't try to prove what you want to prove. Find out what the Bible has to say about it and then believe what the Bible says. Because that's God's word. Does that make sense? It's pretty simple, huh? So important. But sometimes we have to keep reminding ourselves because we, we fall into such ruts as a people. Okay, 13. What will studying the scriptures do for you? 2 Timothy 3.13 says, You have known the Holy Scriptures, which is able to make you what? Wise. Wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And that's what we're studying, God's plan of salvation. Understanding it. Number 14. According to Jesus, where do we find truth? Oh, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth. truth, and the life. Okay. Did you catch that? Do you realize what that's saying? Truth is more than a concept. It's a person. Mm -hmm. Truth is more than a concept. It is a person. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. When we study truth, we're studying to know who he is. Mm -hmm. So example, for example, um, 
All truth is a revelation of who God is. Truth is actually an invitation to know Him better. So when you study the, the, the Bible and it says don't steal, we're learning something about God, that God ha uh, uh, protects your space. He protects boundaries. God respects it and He says, I want you to do the same. Don't be taking what's not yours. And when God says, do not lie, it's telling us that God is honest. He values honesty, and he wants us to value honesty like he does. And when God says, don't commit adultery, God values relationships. And he wants you and I to value relationships, because that's what he's like. Every command in the Bible is a revelation of who God is. Now, if I make the choice not to obey, if I don't like the truth because it's inconvenient and I reject the truth, what have I rejected? Jesus. You rejected Christ. You rejected the invitation. And one rejection will lead to another. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So important. And then John 17, 17 says, Thy word is what? Truth. truth, meaning what? That we find Jesus in our Bibles. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Number 15. What warnings regarding Bible study are given in the Scripture? 2 Timothy 3.17 says, Study to show what? Thyself approved unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth. So if I want to know what, what God approves of, I have to study this for myself. Right? If I want to know what God approves, I have to study. I can't guess, and don't ask me. You need to study. Does that make sense? And God will show you. He's promised. If we ask, He will show us. Um, now, I'm going to blow you away. Did you know that there's actually a Bible writer that we're warned about reading? The Bible actually warns us about reading this. Not that this writer says anything bad. It's just that this writer is so deep and so profound that people often misunderstand what he's saying and they twist his words to their own destruction. Did you know that's actually in the Bible? The Bible will warn you. Say, look, if you're going to read this guy, you better be careful because people misunderstand him and they twist his words to their own destruction. Open your Bibles. Let's take a look and see if Pastor Valte is feeding you a line. <laughs> We're going to 2 Peter chapter 3. You there to 2 Peter? <coughs> That's okay, actually. I was not even there either. Okay, 2 Peter chapter 3. And um, where should I pick up? Let me pick up at verse 14. Therefore, beloved, this is Peter writing. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent uh, to be found by him, Christ, in peace, without spot, and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Also, as also our beloved brother, who? Oh. Paul, writing to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things oh. hard to understand which those who are untaught and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of Scripture. So what, what Peter is saying here is this. Just be careful when you read Paul's writings. He's not saying don't read Paul's writings. It's not what he said because it's Scripture. He says, but when you read it, be careful. If you're reading Paul and he seems to be contradicting what Jesus said, then no, you're misunderstanding him. If you're reading Paul's writing and what he is saying seems to contradict what Moses wrote, you're misunderstanding Paul. If you're reading Paul and he seems to be contradicting what James said, you're misunderstanding him. It's very interesting. You will find that a lot of the weird theology that's out there, typically they use Paul to support their theory and then they use it to undo the rest of Scripture. Exactly what Peter said. Exactly what Peter said. So what do we do, Pastor? Well, just realize if you have Bible writers contradicting each other, you're misunderstanding Paul. Well, that's all. Just keep studying. And I don't know about you. How many, am I the only one who's had trouble with Paul? 
Man, when I got into Romans, I was like, what is he saying? But you know what's interesting? When I started studying the sanctuary and began to understand the plan of salvation, when I began to study this, later I went to Paul's writings, and it made sense. Because Paul's writings are saturated with sanctuary terminology. And when you begin to understand the sanctuary, Paul's writings begin to make sense. Very, very interesting. But okay. So let's go here now, number 16. How should we test all religious teachings and doctrines? Is that 16 or 17? 17. I never changed it? No. Yeah, no, you're not. You, you changed that Fifteen, you didn't bring it up. Oh, I didn't bring it up? Okay, so we're actually on 16. Uh, how should we test all religious teachings and doctrines? Thessalonians 5.21 says, test what? Oh. All things, hold fast to what is good. Test it against what? <coughs> against the Bible, yeah. Whatever teaching you run into, you got to test it to see if it lines up with Scripture. Uh, Acts 17.11. Ooh, No. Open your Bibles to Acts 17. I've got to show you this one. Paul, Paul, um, his name used to be Saul. And he's persecuted the church. Uh, he contributed to the death of, of a number of believers. We don't know how many exactly. But that burden, Paul... Um, who became Paul later, knowing that Christians died on account of him. By the way, do you remember who the first one was? Stephen. Stephen, very good. The Bible says that he was there holding the coats of the men that, that stoned him to death. <clears throat> and Saul was burdened. Saul was probably the most educated Bible writer of all the writers of Scripture. He was probably the most well-educated, extremely intelligent man. Uh, even the Greeks were impressed with him. Uh, with his logic. It was just stellar. A man of incredible mind. That's why we have such a hard time understanding him. <laughs> but, um, but, so, but, but Paul had a burden for the churches. He would go. He was an incredible missionary. Rose up churches. And uh, he shared the truth. But then uh, after he left, other men came that sounded pretty smart. But they, were, they twisted scripture. And then they would deviate from what Paul had, had told them, had taught them. So the books that you have in your Bible are First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, are Paul's letters to these churches. And he's saying, "What are you doing? How have you deviated so quickly from the truth? Do you remember the things I taught you? Why in the world are you following this stuff now? You have crucified Christ afresh. You've deviated from the gospel. You've turned to works. Have you ever read his stuff?" It's amazing. But there's one church that he commended. And I'm going to read to you what that church did. It was not deceived. And uh, so I'm going to read to you uh, verse 10. Are you there? Acts uh, 17, verse 10. You there? Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to where? Berea. Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now watch what he says here. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. There was something different about these guys, and he said they're more fair-minded. Well, what was different about them? Let's read on. In that they received the word with all readiness, and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. So Paul preached, he taught them the truth, and they would go, yeah, that sounds right, but... I'm going to study first to make sure it's correct. And then they studied. They went, oh, okay, yeah, it's in the scriptures. That's true. So when Paul left and other guys came in teaching their version of the gospel, these guys went to the Bible and they went, no, sorry. Hit the road, Jack. That's not true. Are you with me? Now, open your Bible to the book of Berea, chapter 3, verse 5. <laughs> It's not there. Paul never had to write them a letter because they weren't deceived. You and I have to be like that. Whatever is preached, including whatever pastor about to teach us, you take those little lessons home, compare them to your Bible, make sure that it's true. Does that make sense? That is being a wise Berean. And then, of course, Isaiah 8.20 says, 
to the law and to the testimonies, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is a little light in them. There's no light. No light. Is that right? It has to line up with what God teaches in his word. Number 17. <clears throat> what happened when Jesus ex explained the, the scriptures to two discouraged disciples on the road to Emmaus? Luke 24, 32 says, Did not our heart, what? Burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us. You see, friends, when we study the Bible, we're going to have those aha moments and our hearts will burn within us. Uh, number 18. After these two disciples knew that Jesus was alive and heard him explain the prophecies, what did they do? Luke 24, 33 says, they, so they what? Rose up that very hour, returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven, the eleven and those who were with them together. They shared the good news. And when you and I begin to study the Bible for ourselves, our hearts are going to burn within the, in us and we're going to share what we're learning because we want other people to be ready when Jesus returns. I want to end with a story. When I worked, uh, when I was working at First Union Mortgage Corporation in uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, it was a great opportunity for me to witness, well, wherever you work, wherever God places you, you're a missionary, right? Well, there was a fellow there who was also a churchgoer, but in his church, his denomination, uh, and it's a mainline denomination, they view the Bible as being a book of morals, but not being God's inspired, fully authoritative word. And he told me that. In fact, this is what he told me, and I quote, we, we put the Bible on the same level as Aesop's fables. That's what he told me. But I liked the guy. He was a really nice guy. And uh, we worked together. But <clears throat> the thing is, is that it really, he thought it was comical that I took the Bible as it read. That it was literally God's inspired word. And he was always making fun of me. He would mock me. And um, but what was really happening, remember the Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of heavenly places. What was happening is that he was allowing himself to be used by the prince of darkness to harass me. And uh, at the end of the day at work, somehow this guy always managed to finish his work early. He would come down to my area and he would sit behind me in the cubicle and just start making fun of me that I kept the Bible literal. And when he left, I felt oppressed, squashed. And I knew what was happening is that the demons were harassing me. But I liked John. I never, you know, I, I didn't agree with John, but I liked John. Anyway, uh, after several days of this, I finally had had enough. And I was sitting in my chair, and I heard John coming, and I knew it was going to be another episode. And I bowed my head, and I said, Lord, you know I like John, but I've had enough of this. I said, you give me something for John, because I've had it. So I'm sitting here, working away. He sits behind me, he starts up, and I spin around in my chair, and I looked at him, I said, John, I want to ask you some questions. And he said, okay. I said, John, do you believe in God? Oh, he was really offended. Yes, of course I do. I said, good. I said, do you believe in the devil? He said, yes, of course I believe in the devil. I said, do you believe in, God, in good angels, God's angels? Yes, I believe in God's angels. Do you believe in the devil's angels, bad angels? Yes, I believe in them too. I said, do you believe that God sometimes communicates very important information, that's a life and death thing, through his good angels? Yes, I believe that. Do you believe that the Satan also communicates through his bad angels to destroy us? Yes, I believe that too. John, if an angel stood in front of you right now to give you very important information that was pertinent to your soul, how would you know if it was God's angel or the devil's? And he just looked at me. I said, John, that's the difference between you and me. Because of this book, I can tell the difference, and you can't. Amen. But it's praise the Lord. He never bothered me again. That was the end of it. I hope to see him in the kingdom one day. I hope that got him thinking. He had no reply. We need this book, friends. If people err. God does not err. You can trust this book 100%. Make sure you know it. Spend time in it. And as you do, the transforming power of God will be unleashed in your life. And he will change you to be like him. So here's your response to Jesus. Do you desire to fully understand and follow the scriptures? At this very moment, won't you ask Jesus to prompt and strengthen you to take daily time to study his word, to know him and his way better? If you'd like to do that, answer that right there. Let's close out with a word of prayer. 
Father, thank you for the things you've taught us here. Oh, Lord, I pray. Help us to remember that we can trust your word. And that, but Lord, you can't bring out and teach us what we don't put in. We have to spend time in it. Help us to remember that before we open that book, we are to, if we're able to, to kneel before you and to ask you to give us your spirit, the Holy Spirit, and give us wisdom as we study. And then, Lord, help us to remember your only study, we only reveal to us what we need to know. Thank you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me share one more thing before you leave. This is very important. If you read a whole paragraph after you pray and only one thing stands out to you, don't get frustrated. That one thing that stands out to you is the one thing God wants you to be thinking about. Later on, a few months later, you may read that passage again and two things will stand out to you that you didn't catch the first time. Now he's wanting you to look at those two things. <coughs> don't get discouraged. He'll teach you. Keep looking up. God bless you. Safe travels as you head home.